Welcome to the NCLEX Crash Course, in this series we'll cover topics like pharmacology, medical surgical nursing, pediatric nursing, obstetric and gynecological nursing and psychiatric nursing. Don't forget to subscribe for more valuable NCLEX Crash Course episodes. In this video, we are going to continue the topic that is gastrointestinal system major disorders. So in the previous video, we have discussed very important disorders and we discussed about the liver cancer, about the liver cirrhosis. And in previous videos, we also started from the oral cavity and then we included the stomach, the gallbladder. So those videos are very, very important and their nursing care is also very, very important. So make sure to watch those videos uh, before you watch this one. In this uh, session, we are going to see the other diseases in which we will first discuss about the intestinal obstruction. So as the name indicates, when there is obstruction in the intestine, it may include the small intestine or the large intestine. So it depends, uh, location varies. So let's see what is intestinal obstruction. So it is the interference with peristaltic movement of intestinal contents because of neurologic or mechanical impairments. So basically when the peristaltic movement is interfered, what is peristaltic movement? It is the movement of our colon. So the colon or small intestine have this movement due to their mucosal layer which helps in the digestion process. So when this peristaltic movement is interfered due to the neurological impairment, so it may be connected to the neurological or neurons, or it may be due to the mechanical impairment. Something is physically wrong at that area. So that can lead to intestinal obstruction. Now, what can be the causes? So if you talk about the Mechanical causes, so this can be carcinoma of the bowel. So if there is any tumor in the bowel, this can lead to the obstruction. Any hernia, so when there is pro protruding of the organ, when some organ protrude from its location, so that protrusion may lead to the obstruction. Fecal impaction. So when there is obstruction due to the fecal matter. Adhesions. So if there are any kind of adhesions, for example, scar tissue forms abnormal connections after surgery. So whenever there is a surgery, so the scar tissue inside the inside that skin layer, that scar tissue can form the adhesions. And that adhesions can lead to the inflammation and that can lead to obstruction. Intersusception. What is intersusception? It is telescoping of bowel on itself. So when there will be a knot formation of the bowel within itself, that is called intersusception. So this will lead to the circulate, uh, circulate free impairment and further can lead to the obstruction. Volvulus. So when there will be twisting of the intestine. So intersusception is different. It is a telescoping and volvulus is different. This is a twisting of the intestine. Other reason can be paralytic ileus. So in paralytic ileus, interference with the neural innovation of intestines resulting in decrease or absence of the peristalsis may be caused by surgical manipulation, electrolyte imbalance or infection. So basically what happens here that in paralytic ileus, as the name indicates, the ileum will have the deficiency to peristalt. So the peristaltic movement will be absent due and due to any neural innovation. So if there is any disturbance to the neural innovation, for example, caused by the surg surgery, or if there is any electrolyte imbalance or infection, so that can lead to the paralytic ileus and obstruction of the intestine. Mesenteric infarction. So mesenteric artery is very important to supply blood to the intestine and to our gut. So when there is infarction, which means that there is a you know a decrease in the blood supply. So this is the occlusion of the arterial blood supply to the bowel leading to necrosis of bowel. So basically, the circulation will be not able to pass in the bowel and will lead to necrosis. 
So all the causes we can see here can be tumor, hernia, fecal matter, adhesions due to surgery, intersusception, volvulus, paralytic ileus, and mesenteric infarction. Now moving on to the clinical findings. So what we can uh, you know, observe and what we can assess in the patient. So patients complain. Let's see the patient's complaint. So there will be colicky abdominal pain. Patient will report a colicky abdominal pain constipation that may be accompanied by urge to defecate without results and seepage of the fecal liquid. So we can see here that patient will complain pain at the first. So th this will be the earlier symptom due to the obstruction. And due to the obstruction, there will be a difficulty in bowel movement, bowel passage that may lead to constipation. And this can be combined by the urge to defecate without results. So person will have the urgency to pass the stool but he or she will fail to do so next is the objective finding the things we will find out in the patient so we will find ab abdominal distension so when there is obstruction so of course there will be distension due to the stagnation of the food and fluid at the particular uh, part of the intestine Vomiting may occur that may contain fecal matter. So when there is obstruction of the intestine, so the fecal matter that has, you know, stopped or get blocked can reflex back in the esophagus and that can come out through the vomiting. Initially increased progressing to decreased or absent bowel sounds. So bowel sounds are very important to assess so in the patient having intestinal obstruction, first there will be increase in the bowel sound, but then they will progressively decrease or will get absent. Clinical findings of dehydration and electrolyte balance imbalance. Okay, so in clinical findings, we can see that when there will be obstruction, so malabsorption will occur and fluid and electrolyte balance will get disturbed. Obstipation. Flat plate of abdomen shows bowel distended with air. So here, obstipation means that there will be complete constipation. Patient will be not able to pass the stools for several days. And the abdomen will appear to be flat plate and this will show bowel distended with the air. Now moving on to the therapeutic interventions. So the first intervention that is the management that we'll do is we will restrict the oral intake as there is obstruction in the intestine. So there will be obstruction of the passage of the bowel and that may not pass. So constipation is very, very common. That's why there should be restriction of the food. So instead, we will make the patient nothing per oral and we will administer the parenteral fluid and electrolytes so all the nutrients will be provided by the other method that can be the peripheral or the central you know parenteral nutrition second is the surgical intervention so if there is any obstruction then the corrective thing that we can do is we have to perform the surgery so you have to correct the cause if there is hernia we have to replace that Adhesions should be removed. Colostomy can be done. So there can be a creation of opening outside the abdomen so that the uh, the fecal content can get out without crossing the obstruction. Secostomy. So secostomy can be done also to make the fecal matter pass easily or ileostomy. So these three are the different openings that are created uh, in the abdomen and the pouch is you know, kept outside of the body and everything that the patient intakes and every fecal matter that is made by that food will not be able to pass by the obstruction. So therefore, there will be a bypass created or we can say there will be artificial pouch created outside the body. Third thing we can do is we can do decompression of GI tract. So we have to remove all the content that is already in the intestine that is obstructed. So decompression will be done of the GI tract via the nasogastric or intestinal tube. So that content which is stuck will be removed 
by the ng or the intestinal tube now what is the nursing care of clients with intestinal obstruction so first thing is assessment so what are the things that we have to involve in the assessment of the patient having uh, intestinal obstruction so first of all we have to collect the detailed history to determine risk and causative factors so we have to ask everything in detail that if patient had any previous surgery or we have to ask if patient has any you know previous tumor history or hernial history so all these things we have to ask second thing is we have to do you know check the abdomen for peristaltic waves and distension so we have to do the inspection we can do the palpation to see if the abdomen is distended and we can auscultate to see the peristaltic waves we have to check the presence and characteristics of the bowel sounds so if there is obstruction so in the early stage there will be increased bowel sounds whereas with time the bowel sounds become absent in the obstruction then we can check pattern and characteristics of bowel elimination so we have to tell if patient has constipation when the constipation occurs and how, after how much duration patient passes the stool so after collecting all this history we can you know assume or analyze that yes patient has intestinal obstruction now moving on to the planning and implementation so what we are going to plan for the patient so there is obstruction therefore there will be disturbance in the fluid and electrolyte balance there will be disturbance in the nutrient level so we have to relieve all these things so we have to monitor the patient for dehydration and electrolyte imbalance intake and output second thing is we have to auscultate the patient's abdomen for bowel sounds to so check the obstruction degree and we have to identify the passage of flatus so we have to identify and we can ask the patient if he has passed the flatus or not that will indicate that yes there is uh, some uh, no low degree of the uh, this obstruction then administer meticulous oral hygiene so we have to maintain the oral hygiene as patient will be on npo that is nothing for oral so patient will not eat anything but still we have to tell the patient that oral hygiene should be maintained then we have to encourage the fluids and foods high in fiber if constipated so if patient is not kept on npo or if patient is on tpn then foods should be high in fiber so that the constipation can be relieved and we have to encourage the fluid intake to maintain the hydration level in the body next is we have to provide special care associated with an intestinal tube so if patient has intestinal tube if patient has been gone through the decompression of the gi tract why the intestinal tube so there should be a specific care with the intestinal tube so what is that care we have to see here after tube reaches stomach position on right side to facilitate passage of tube through pylorus so when the tube is inserted in the stomach in the intestine then patient has to maintain the right side position so that the insertion or passage of the tube is easy through the py pylorus of the stomach then the patient has to be in semi forward position to permit gradual advance into intestine so there should be a specific position when the uh, physician is you know inserting the intestinal tube so when it is going through the fundus pylorus of the stomach then the patient has to maintain the right side position so this is very very important from the nclx point of view second when we have to insert it through the intestine so at that time semi forward position should be maintained coil and loosely attach extra tubing to client's gown to avoid tension against peristaltic action so this is also very important 
we have to make sure that the tube has extra length so that it does not get too much stressed and it will not lead to tension against the peristaltic action. Third thing is instill or irrigate with sterile saline every 6 to 8 hours or as ordered to maintain potency. So as intestinal tube can be obstructed by the food and fluid and any other foreign body, so we have to irrigate it with sterile water every 6 to 8 hours so that to maintain the potency. Assess advancement of tube by identifying markings on the tube. So in intestinal tube, there are different markings that indicates that the tube has reached to some part of the body. Record the level of advancement. Advance usually two to three inches every hour as ordered. Okay, so this is the process of inserting the intestinal tube. That is, it should be advanced every two to three inches every hourly. It should be not done at a single time. It should be done gradually and slowly. So two to three inches every hour is the standard timing. When tube is discontinued, remove gradually because it is being pulled again the peristalsis. This is, this is also very, very important here. So when the pool, uh, when the tube is discontinued, we have to be make sure that the tubes should be removed slowly and gradually in the uh, quite a good amount of time so that it does not, you know, create a opposition to the peristaltic movement. And this can lead to the nausea, vomiting and other complications in the patient. So after the planning, what is the evaluation? what we are going to expect at the ending. So we expect that patient establishes a regular pattern of bowel elimination. So the major symptoms we have seen that patient will have constipation, so that should be relieved. So the bowel elimination should be regular. And the patient maintains fluid and electrolyte balance. So these are the two outcomes that we expect from the patient. The next disorder is diverticular disease. Now, what is diverticular disease? As the name indicates, there will be a diverticular or we can see there is a diversion that has caused the normal peristaltic movement or normal passage of the food impaired. So, we can see in this image that this is the large intestine. This is the ascending colon transfer colon and this is the descending colon. This is a cecum and this is appendix. This is the sigmoid colon. So in diverticula, there is a pouch formation. We can see that there are the holes and outs, uh, from, if we look from the inside, there will be holes that will appear and from outside, there will be a pouch that will form. So if we see the, what is diverticulosis? So multiple pouch like herniations of intestinal mucosa as a result of weakness and increased intra-abdominal pressure may be asymptomatic. So what happens here that there is a pouch like formation. So if we see from the outside of the intestine, there will be a bulging. And from the inside, if the dissection is done, so it will appear like a hole. Or we can see a hollow space. So we can see here that this is a diverticulosis. What is diverticulitis? So as the name indicates, there will be inflammation. So inflammation caused by food or fecus trapped in the diverticulum. So if this pouch gets filled by the food or the fecus, and that will lead to inflammation. So that is diverticulitis. This can lead to bleeding, perforation, abscess formation, peritonitis, and bowel obstruction. So there can be many complications due to the diverticulum. So this was about the diverticular disease. Now moving on to the risk factors, what leads to the diverticular disease. So we have seen here that there will be a increased abdominal pressure or there is weakening of the muscles of the intestine that has lead to 
pouch formation so all these things can be due to the genetic predisposition or inadequate dietary fiber history of constipation with straining at stool so these things can lead to increase in the intra abdominal pressure and can lead to the diverticular formation and the incidence increases with the age so as the age in increase so the muscle strength decreases and whenever the uh, pressure is applied during the stool passage so that pressure leads to the diverticulum formation so what are the clinical findings that we will see in the patient so patient will complain cramping colicky pain in the left lower quadrant nausea and malaise so this are the complaints of the patient so there will be cramping pain colicky pain in the left lower quadrant so this is the left lower quadrant nausea and malaise in objective data we will observe diarrhea or constipation frank blood in the stool due to the rupture of the diverticulum abdominal distension and fever in diagnostic test the complete blood count reveals leukocytosis so when the foreign body is trapped in the diverticulus so the wbc will increase as the immune response ct scan abdominal radiograph and colonoscopy provide direct evidence of the disease so through all these investigations the pouch can be easily seen and this confirms the disease moving on to the therapeutic interventions so what is the management that we can provide to the patient so prevention through high fiber diet so the first thing is we have to provide a high fiber diet so that the stool passage is very smooth and there is not much straining by the patient studies demonstrate that intake of seeds nuts popcorn does not increase incidence of the disease so all these things will not lead to the increase of the incidence of disease npo or clear liquids during acute diverticulitis so we have to provide clear liquids and we have to keep the patient npo so that there is the rest to the gut provided and pouch do not get filled with the food in medical management that is pharmacological management analgesics for the pain antibiotics because there is inflammation so infection can occur so ciprofloxacin that is cipro metronidazole that is flagyl cefalexin that is keflex doxycycline that is vibramycin antispasmodics that is chlordiazepoxide or clidinium that is librex dicyclomine that is bentyl and bulk forming laxatives and stool softeners are given so our basic goal is that the stool passage should be smooth and there will be no increase in the con uh, abdominal pressure of the patient so we have to avoid straining that's why the high fiber diet the anti spasmodics the laxatives the high uh, you know the bulk forming laxatives stool softeners will be given we have to uh, replace the fluid and electrolyte because when the patient is kept npo then we have to maintain the hydration of the body in surgery hemicolectomy will be done so in hemicolectomy partially the you know colon will be uh, opened okay temporary loop colostomy can be done or removal of involved bowel for perforation fistula abscess or recurrent disease can be done so these are the surgical interventions in which if we talk about the hemicolectomy so in hemicolectomy as the name indicates that one side of the colon is removed is removed so as if right hemicolectomy is done so it involves removing the right side of the colon and attaching the small intestine so small intestine will be attached to the rem remaining portion of the abdomen sorry of the colon so where the diverticuli is present so that area will be removed and the uh, remained part is attached to the remained colon and if we talk about the temporary loop uh colostomy so in temporary loop colostomy a hole is cut 
in the side of the colon and stitch to the corresponding hole in the abdominal wall. So basically, there will be a hole created on the, if, if we say this is the, so if we say this is the large intestine. So there will be a hole created here. And that hole is cut in the side of the colon and stitched to, to, to the corresponding hole in the abdominal wall. So this is how it will be stitched. And this will be done so that the diverticuli can be removed. Now moving on to the nursing care of the clients with diverticular disease. So we have to do the assessment. We have to uh, you know, take the detailed history of constipation or diarrhea with progression of clinical findings. We have to know about the foods that may precipitate acute diverticulitis. We have to assess tool for the consistency and presence of blood. We have to check the abdomen for distension and we have to check the bowel sounds extent. Next is planning and implementation. So what are the things that we have to plan for the patient having diverticulitis? So we have to teach the importance of high fiber diet and high fluid intake so that the stool passage is easy. Foods that should be avoided to prevent diverticulitis. So we have to avoid all that foods that will lead to the constipation and straining and thus pouch formation in the colon. We have to teach to prevent constipation with diet-free bran and prescribed bulk laxatives. We have to maintain the patient NPO and gastric de decompression if ordered during the acute episode. We have to monitor for clinical findings of peritonitis. So we have to check if patient has pain, hypotension, abdominal rigidity, abdominal distension, leukocytosis. So if these clinical findings are observed, then peritonitis can be there. We have to administer fluids and electrolytes if patient is on nothing per oral. We have to teach the importance of completing antibiotic regimen because if antibiotic course is left in between, so it can lead to the resistance of that bacteria. So it should be completed well and thus to prevent the infection. We have to provide care related to the bowel surgery. So this is the planning we have to do. And what we expect after the nursing care, that patient states attainment of soft formed bowel movements, maintains dietary regimen, reports relief from pain, and maintains fluid and electrolyte balance. So all these are the uh, things that we expect at the ending. Now moving on to the next disease. That is cancer of the small intestine, colon, or rectum. So cancer can occur in the small intestine or in the large intestine or in the rectum. So we have to study this. So if we talk about the etiology and pathophysiology, tumor cause narrowing of the bowel lumen, ulcerations, necrosis or perforations. So if there is any cancerous cell present or cancerous tissue growth present, so that tissue growth will lead to narrowing of that part and that will lead to obstruction of the bowel passage and that cancer cells can lead to ulcer formation, necrosis due to decreased blood supply and perforation. Risk factors can be familial polyps. So if there are polyps present, Aging can lead to the cancer of rectum, colon, and the small intestine, chronic ulcerative colitis, bowel stasis, ingestion of food additives, and high fat, low fiber diet. So this high fat diet, lo taking low fibers, all these things can aggravate the symptoms of the, we can say uh, can lead to the cause of this disease. Cancer of colon is more common in males. Incidence increases after 50 years of age. Cancer of small intestine is rare. Adenocarcinoma of large intestine is more common. So here, the large intestine is the common place where the cancer will occur known as adenocarcinoma. But in small intestine, the cancer is seen rarely. In clinical findings, the subjective data will be abdominal discomfort or pain, weakness, fatigue. So the symptoms will be common as the other GIT symptoms. 
In objective data, we will find alterations in usual bowel function, that is constipation or diarrhea, alternating constipation and diarrhea in combination, change in the shape of stool, that is pencil-shaped stool, ribbon-shaped stool, abdominal distension will be present, weight loss will be there due to malabsorption and frank or occult blood in the stool. Then, if a digital examination is done, then there will be palpable mass detected. Proctosigmoidoscopy. So, if the endoscopy is done by the sigmoid or if by the colon, so it allows for the direct visualization of the bowel. So, we can visualize the bowel for the tumor growth. And if biopsy is done, so it will be seen clearly. Cytologic examination of tissue from GI tract detects the malignant cells. So when biopsy will be done, the cytological examination will be done. So malignant cells will be seen. Increased alkaline phosphate, that is ALP, and aspartate aminotransferase, that is AST, also known as SGPT and SDOT. Levels detect the metastasis to liver. So if these both uh, enzymes of the liver are increased, so it detects that the liver can also be affected due to the cancer of these organs. Increased serum carcinoma, carcinoembryonic antigen. So if CAE, that is carcinoembryonic antigen is increased, this indicate or may indicate the carcinoma of the colon. Now moving on to the therapeutic interventions. So what is the management that we will provide here? So as it is the cancer, so obviously the, the management should be will, be, will include chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and the surgical intervention. So first of all, we will try to re uh, remove the tumor and restore the bowel function. So if the tumor is confined, so we can do the surgical intervention. For example, colostomy, hemicolectomy, abdominal perineal resection will be done to remove the tumor. In radiation therapy, it reduces the size of tumor in non-surgical situations, may be used preoperatively to reduce size of the tumor. So before, if the if patient surgery is planned and if the tumor size is large, so that tumor size can be reduced by the radiation therapy. And it can be also used after the surgery to limit the metastasis. So if there are the chance of the spreading of the cancer, so to reduce the metastasis risk. It may be external radiation therapy or internal radiation therapy. For example, needles, seeds, wire, catheters. So all these include the internal radiation therapy and external is the uh, that traditional radiotherapy done. In chemotherapy, there is reduction of the size of tumor and it limits the metastasis. Medication can, may be given for systematic effect or instilled into the organ or body cavity. So in chemotherapy, the chemical agents are given to reduce the size of the tumor or that can be directly given for the systematic effect in the blood or directly in the organ. Targeted therapy, cetuzumab, penitumumab, all these are the agents used and the, in the chem chemical therapy. In therapeutic interventions, we have to prepare the patient for the surgery. So we have to administer the antibiotics. For example, neomycin, sulfonamides uh, are given to reduce the bacteria in the bowel. We have to check the blood type and cross match the blood for transfusions to correct the anemia. Vitamin supplements to improve nutritional status will be done. Gastric or intestinal decom decompression will be done to remove the bowel. Uh, you know, the stool. Uh, bowel preparation will be done. That is liquid diet, laxatives, enemas will be given to make the bowel soft and the stool passage should be easy. So before the surgery, we have to make the patient infection free. We have to be ready with the blood and blood products. So whenever there is anemia, we can provide the blood. We have to provide the vitamin supplements to meet the nutritional needs, we can decompress the gastric content and we have to do the bowel preparation. So these were the therapeutic interventions. Moving on to the nursing care of client with cancer of small intestine, colon or rectum. So in assessment, we have to assess the client for the, to check the risk factors and clinical findings. So we will check the 
risk factors associated with the disease and we have to do the clinical findings. Next is we have to check this tool for frequency, color, consistency and shape. So as it has mentioned that in cancer, the stool can be ribbon shaped or they can be very thin shaped. That is pencil shaped. So we have to check the shape of the this stool and we have to check the consistency that if there is constipation, if there is diarrhea, we have to check the color or the increased bilirubin level. If there is increased bilirubin level, so there will be yellowish discoloration. We have to check the weight for baseline data because patient will have weight loss. We have to check the abdomen for discomfort on palpation. We have to check the presence and extent of the bowel sounds. So all these are the basic assessment that we have to do for the patients, for every patient having the GI problems. Moving on to the planning and implementation. So we have to check the, uh, the vital signs of the patient. We have to check the abdominal pain that is increasing, nausea, vomiting to de detect early clinical findings of complications. We have to monitor the potency of gastric or intestinal tube, instill or irrigate with the normal saline as ordered, identify amount and character of the drainage. So these things should be also take care of. So we have to see if the intestinal tube is patent, if the irrigation is done, and we have to check the character of drainage, that what is amount of drainage, what is, is the color of the drainage to see if the, uh, the content of the stomach is normal. We have to implement pre-operative bowel preparations. So we have to provide laxatives and intestinal antisepsis should be maintained by giving the antibiotics. We have to administer the prescribed chemotherapeutic drugs, monitor for the significant side effects. For example, in the chemotherapeutic drugs, stomatitis can occur, dehydration, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, leukopenia. All, the, all these are the side effects of the chemotherapeutic drugs. So these should be also observed. We have to administer the electrolyte and parenteral fluid replacement as ordered for bleeding, vomiting or obstruction. We have to provide progressive diet as ordered and we have to assess the tolerance. So we have to start with the soft diet, moving on to the semi-solid and then solid diet. We have to also assess the tolerance that what is the patient's tolerance level. We have to teach the dietary modifications that the client should have a low fat, high fiber diet. And this should be educated to the client and the family. We have to tell the patient to avoid gas forming foods and stimulants, ensure adequate fluid intake, eat foods that support the body's natural defense mechanism, particularly nutrient dense foods, for example, fruits, vegetables, cereal, grains, legumes, lean meat, fish, and poultry. So, these foods that will increase the immunity will help in supporting the body's natural defense mechanism should be consumed. Tell the patient to eat a variety of foods that are as close to the pre-surgical diet as they possible. Take prescribed vitamin and mineral supplements. So these all things should be given before the surgery or even if the patient has no surgery, then these things should be taken care of. Provide pre-operative and post-operative care for colon surgery. This is a different topic, but here we have to only see that if there is colon surgery like hemicolectomy, then preoperative and postoperative care should be given. Provide care after colostomy. So in the colostomy care, assess clients and family members' reaction to colostomy. Depends on how colostomy is viewed, how it affects lifestyle, physical and emotional status, social and cultural background, and place and role in the family. Stages of grieving may be evident. So as the colostomy can be you know a very different thing for the patient in the family so we have to make sure that we know about the patient's background their culture the family emotional status everything should be you know well familiar with so that we can make the family and patient adjust with the thing Consider that client with a cecostomy or colostomy is specially sensitive to odors and gestures and facial expressions of others. So all these things we have to remember. This is very, very important that 
patient having cholesterol will be easily triggered by the bad odor or other facial expressions patient have a bad can have a bad mental you know health mental health can be affected by these responses by the others because colostomy pack can be unappealing to others so we have to make sure that patient do not find anything wrong during this time we have to assess the color of stoma expected is brick red so if the color of the stoma is brick red so basically stoma is a opening artificial opening created on the abdomen when the stool cannot pass through the normal anus then the artificial opening is created from the colon that is colostomy so the color of the stoma should be brick red if there is inadequate perfusion that is circulation of blood so the stoma will appear gray or pale pink or dark purple and these this color should be immediately reported teach that colostomy drainage begins in 3 to 4 days it can be controlled by the following a regular irrigation schedule and dietary modifications of colostomy in the distal colon okay so we have to teach all teach all the colostomy care to the patient and the family members provide colostomy care encourage involvement in colostomy care as soon as physical and emotional status permits teach need to periodically dilate stoma to prevent strictures so this is also important we have to teach to dilate the stoma so that stricture do not form instruct client and family to prevent post operative infection through meticulous hand hygiene so whenever you are handling the stoma you are handling the patient having uh, after the surgery so hand washing should be done meticulously to prevent the infection avoidance of sick individuals and people who recently received pneumonia or influenza vaccines if possible so patients or people having the vaccine of influenza and pneumonia should be you know prevented from the close contact with the patient because patient can catch the infection due to low immunity we have to teach about resumption of activities to a close as possible to previous lifestyle including sexual activity however contact sports should be avoided so patient can continue the normal activity day by day and sexual activity can be continued but we have to make sure that the contact sports should be avoided because it can lead to the injury teach need for regular medical supervision arrange for follow up care within community agencies as required for example home care programs american cancer society ostomy resource person so this is the planning and implementation for the patient in evaluation we will make sure that patient maintains adequate fluid and electrolyte balance patient resumes regular pattern of bowel elimination client or family member demonstrates ability to perform ostomy care discusses feelings concerning diagnosis prognosis and ostomy and maintain nutritional status so here our goal is that the patient will have a normal lifestyle there will be a normal nutritional status the fluid requirement should be met the bowel elimination should be normal and the family member and the client will have a good mental health and all the concerns should be taken care of so this we expect at the ending so this was about the cancer of colon rectum and small intestine now let's move on to the next disease that is peritonitis so peritonitis is a condition that is you know seen in uh, seen very commonly in many gi disorders so it can be a symptom or we can say it it can be a clinical finding in various gi disorders like in patient having hernia in patient having liver cirrhosis so peritonitis is commonly seen so what is basically peritonitis so it is a inflammation of the peritoneum it is the most caused by the e coli so peritoneum is the cavity in our abdomen it is it's, it surrounds the abdomen and when it is inflamed it is called peritonitis it is generally caused by infection from perforation of the gi tract cervical stress or trauma so peritoneum is basically a cavity or we can say it is a fluid filled cavity which surrounds our gi organs so when it is infected from the perforation of gi tract due to any chemical stress or due to any trauma or if infection occur then it is called peritonitis so what is the clinical finding so patient having peritonitis will complain 
abdominal pain, rebound tenderness, malaise, and nausea. In objective data, we will find abdominal muscle rigidity, vomiting, increased temperature, and total WBC count. So WBC count will increase, particularly neutrophils. So neutrophil level will increase because of the infection. Moving on to the therapeutic interventions. So what is the management that we will provide to the patient? So first of all, we will provide bed rest to the patient in semi forward position because it will ease the to localize drainage to dependent portion of the abdominal cavity. So semi forward position can be given so that there is ease in the moving of the uh, all the drainage and the abdominal cavity will have a less pressure and there will be easy breathing. Nasogastric decompression until passing flatus. So if patient is not able to pass flatus, if there is a difficulty in passage of the stool, then NG decompression can be done. Parenteral replacement of fluids and electrolytes can be done. Total parental nutrition if necessary. Antibiotic therapy will be started and analgesics will be given for the pain. And at last, surgery will be done to correct the cause of peritonitis. So, if the cause is appendectomy, if incision, drainage of abscess, closure of perforation. So, if there is perforation, then closure will be done. If there is abscess, then it will be drained. Incision will be made. Appendectomy will be done. So, whatever the cause, that will be resolved to decrease the peritonitis symptoms. Now, what is the nursing care of clients with peritonitis? So in assessment, we have to check the temperature to see if there is present of, presence of infection. Guarded movements and self-splinting should be assessed. Okay, So we have to assess the patient's guarded movement. This patient has the guarded movement. It means that patient is self-limiting himself, is doing such activities to have a less motion or self-splinting, that means that it can be due to peritonitis. Reduction or absence of bowel sounds will, uh, you know, give a sign of peritonitis. Presence and characteristics of abdominal pain should be found to see the peritonitis. In planning and implementation, we have to maintain the semi forward position to ease the drainage on the dependent position. To monitor the vital signs, especially the temperature, Monitor the extent and characteristics of pain, administer analgesics as prescribed. Monitor the IV therapy, GI decompression and intake and output. Auscultate for the bubble sounds, identify passage of the flatus and administer the prescribed IV by antibiotics. So these are the general measures and we can say general planning that we have to do in commonly all the GI disorders. So the, checking the bubble sounds, providing the fluids and electrolytes, checking the intake and output, uh, checking the temperature and seeing the characteristics of pain. Everything should be done for these patients. In evaluation, we will expect that patient report absence of pain, patient maintains fluid and electrolyte balance and reestablish the regular pattern of bowel elimination. So all these things we expect. Now moving on to the hemorrhoids. So this is the last disease of this session. So what is hemorrhoid? So hemorrhoid is the varicosities of the rectum. It means that there is the distension of the vein. It means that the vein present in the rectum will be distended due to increase in the pressure. So that those distended veins will lead to formation of the hemorrhoids in the rectum. These hemorrhoids can be internal or external. So they can appear outside of the rectum and can be seen visibly through the anus and it can be internal. The risk factors are due to prolonged sitting or standing that will increase the pressure and that will lead to venous stasis. Straining and defecation will lead to the increase in pressure, obesity and pregnancies. So all these factors which impair the circulation which impair the blood circulation and lead to the venous stasis that means the venous blood will become stagnant so that stagnation of the venous blood will lead in the increase in the vein and distension of the vein 
and that distension of the vein will lead to the prominency of that vein into the hemorrhoids. In clinical findings, the patient will report anal pressure, pain and pruritus that is itching at the anus. In objective data, we will see protrusion of the varicosities around anus, erectile bleeding and mucus discharge. We will see there. In therapeutic interventions, we have to provide low roughage diet. We have to eliminate raw fruits, vegetables during acute exacerbations. High fiber diet during remissions to prevent constipation. Stool softeners will be given so that the passage of stool will be easy and there will be less pressure on the rectum. And bulk catheteretics to facilitate passage of the stools. Analgesic suppositories and ointments, sits bath can be given. So this is very, very important. Sits bath will be given to uh, relieve the hemorrhoids or ice compressions for discomfort can be given. In surgical interventions, ligation. So in internal hemorrhoids, they can be ligated, which means they are tied and they are cut. They are removed with the rubber band. So they are ligation means they are tied by the rubber bands and then they are removed. In cryosurgery, the electric shock will be given in a low amount to remove the hemorrhoids. Laser can be done, sclerotherapy can be done and hemorrhoidectomy that is removal of the hemorrhoids can be done. In nursing care, we will assess the patient for the causative factors that is prolonged sitting, constipation, etc. Presence and characteristic of pain, pain and bleeding and presence of hemorrhoids in the perineal area. So, if we have to first collect the detailed history, then we have to assess the patient's complaints and then we have to check by the visualization. In planning, we have to teach the client to promote comfort with sit bath. So, in sit bath, 105 to 110, 10 degree Fahrenheit temperature water is kept in the tub and patient is advised to sit in the tub and this will relieve the pain of the patient. Ice compressors can be used. Local analgesics will be reduced to relieve pain. Teach client to ensure sufficient private time for defecation, especially after the meals. Increase intake of high fiber food that will ease in defecation. Drink at least 8 glasses of fluids per day so that the fluid should be maintained and the stool passage will be easy. Avoid routine use of laxatives because laxatives will result in dependency. Take prescribed bulk agents for example Xylium, Metamucil which is very common. Xylium is a you know we can say a plant which is used and it has a high fiber content and it helps in loading the stool or stool softeners known as docustate sodium call case can be used implement regular bowel habits in the patient provide care after hemorrhoidectomy so when hemorrhoids are removed so we have to monitor for rectal hemorrhage because bleeding can occur and we have to assess for the urine retention post operatively Explain that some bleeding with the bowel movement is expected because surgery has been done there. Teach how to administer reten retention anema or second or third post-operative day if ordered. So on the second or third operative day, we have to tell the patient that how to administer a, a retention anema to stimulate defecation and softening of the stool. In evaluation, we will accept, expect a re patient reports increased comfort, particularly on defecation. Patient adheres to the treatment regimen and patient establishes a pattern of regular bowel movements without straining or use of laxatives. So if patient has hemorrhoids, so we expect that patient do not complain pain, can ease, easily defecate the stool, will have a regular bowel pattern and will not strain or use laxatives. So this is all we expect from the patient. So this all was all about this session. I hope that this session helped you in preparing for the topic that is major disorders of GIT system. And we will discuss some more important questions or we can say more important topics in our next video. Till then, keep practicing the questions related to this topic and keep learning. Thank you.